so uh, we are starting Ruth, and we are going to look at Ruth through the eyes of stewardship. Uh, stewardship isn't a word that we use much in our society, uh, in our culture. It's a common theme, however, in Scripture, and I believe it starts on page one. But before we go there, let's look at the dictionary definition of stewardship. Uh, the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Oftentimes when we hear stewardship, we think, especially in the church setting, we think of money. And so you're like, stewardship, all right, here comes the, here comes the, the, the cash ask, right? So this is what stewardship is according to the dictionary and what we see it as in scripture as well. The careful <clears throat> and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So... Like I said, stewardship is in all of the Bible. Stewardship is implicit in the biblical text. When you open up Genesis chapter 1, you look and you see that Adam and Eve were made stewards or managers of God's creation. We've talked about that several times. In fact, I think it probably comes up every sermon. It's it's, It's just a fact of the matter. When they were created as managers, it it implied so much and it has so much impact on the rest of scriptures and where we are and how we interpret life today. So we see that God gives them commands and then what does God do? He walks away, just like a owner would do uh, for the managers to do their thing. And then he comes back and he calls them into question with what he had given them to do. And we see that they, uh, in the end, failed the test. Uh, the, script, uh, the scriptures continue to speak of God giving stewardship to the nation of Israel and to uh, humankind through blessings, through commands. God gives specific commands, expectations for Israel to go into the land that he gave them. And really, it's a way of saying, you guys don't actually own this land. I own the land, and you are stewards of this land. We find stewardship in the very last page of the scriptures In Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 and 15, it says this, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed are those who do his commands. You hear that? Blessed are the ones who do his commands, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers. Sorry, dogs. Not all dogs go to heaven, apparently. Outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I don't think that's literally talking about dogs, by the way. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. We're encouraged with this. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Why? Because we are stewards of what God has given us. The breath that we breathe in our lungs has been given to us by God. Our life has been given to us. So this study, we are going to look into whole life stewardship through the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles, you could turn to the book of Ruth. Our main idea today and for the series is basically this. You are responsible to God with what you do with and in your life. And it may sound pretty similar to what we've been talking about the last few weeks, because it is. You are responsible to God with what you do with and in your life. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is Yahweh's. And all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. He is, according to the word of God, he is the owner. And we are stewards. So chapter 1 of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1, says like this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were uh, Milan and Chilion. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. 
So as we first open up this passage of scripture, there's some things that we're going to take note of, right? Uh, first, it says this, it was the time of the judges. So what does that mean? If you look back just one book right before, you'll see the scripture, uh, the book is called the book of judges, right? And the one thing that would um, summarize this time in Israel's past is this uh, verse taken from Judges chapter 17, verse 6. It says this, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Contrast that with Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We also see this, that during that time, there was a famine in the land. For us, famines, they impact us a little bit, but not quite as much as, we don't, we don't feel it quite as much because we have all of these trade and commerce things going on in our lives. So we don't live in this agrarian culture like they did where their land and their life were tied inseparably together. Life was tied to the land. So famines during this time were life and death matters. Deuteronomy 11, 16, 17 gives us this uh, to see maybe what's going on in this time. It says, take care. This was a command that God gave to Israel uh, before they went into the land. He says, take care lest your heart be deceived. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Verse 17, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land which the Lord is giving you. So as I said, this time is a time where everyone's going off and doing their own thing. You can see and read in the book of Judges Uh, the ups and the downs of the Israelite people as they serve God and God saves them and gives them uh, blessings and then they turn from God and they turn to these other gods. All of a sudden they find themselves in poverty and oppression and they cry out to God and God raises up judges to rescue them every time. But it would seem that this famine is coming in part due to some of their disobedience. And so Ruth and Elimelech, or not Ruth and Elimelech, but Naomi and Elimelech with their two boys decide to move to a country that is just to the southeast of Israel, just across the Dead Sea. They didn't go across the Dead Sea, I don't think. I think they walked around. But they go into the land of Moab, a neighboring nation. It has similar script, similar people. Uh, The only difference, the really big difference for the Moabites were their gods, the gods that they worshiped. They didn't worship Yahweh. They worshiped other gods. And oftentimes those other gods would call for child sacrifice and all sorts of things. At times in the book of Judges, you'll see also that Moab and Israel, they're enemies, but sometimes they're friends. And so here we are. The first thing that we see from this passage of scripture is we see Elimelech and Naomi. They have two mouths to feed. The decision, let's just go into that situation as the land and your life are tied together. The land is not producing. Elimelech and Naomi, they're looking at their two sons. The decision is not coming easy to make this move. I imagine that after a feeble meal of what they had for that day, as they're thinking about and laying out their meal plans for the future, as they lay their boys down to sleep, as their boys say, hey, mom, my my tummy still hurts a little bit. And she's thinking, yeah, okay, yes, yep. A lot of us, we can't imagine the weight of that. A lot of us might be able to actually imagine that. I know sometimes whenever my son He goes, my belly hurts. I'm like, well, we need to get you some food right now. But either way, Elimelech and Naomi are feeling the weight of this. I can imagine the kiss goodnight, the conversation that later would happen with the parents of Elimelech uh, and Naomi as they're going, what are we going to do? And Elimelech's like, well, I heard there's a job in Moab, and I I hear that they have food. 
Maybe we can go there. And, and Naomi's saying, well, we can't just leave our home. We can't just leave our family, our relatives. We can't just leave where we've been planted our whole lives. They make the decision that they think is best for their family. Whether right or wrong, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, they think, I need to feed my family. I need to feed my two boys. And so what they decide to do is they decide to sojourn, and that word sojourn means uh, to go to a place in hopes to return one day. You're not going to live there forever. You're not uh, immigrating. You're, You're coming back. You plan to come back to your hometown. So they leave with the intention of returning. And then the scriptures take a turn here in verse 3. It says this, But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. So in the land of Moab, Elimelech dies, verse 4, and it says this, These, his two sons, their two sons, they took Moabite wives, and the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. A little fun fact, Orpah is actually where Oprah got her name. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. You could look it up later. They lived there about 10 years. Verse 5, and both Milan and Chilion died, so that the women, or the woman, was left without her two sons and her two husbands. Okay, you could read that a lot. You can get confused with the names. Not confused, but you can get kind of like, did he say the name correctly? And you can miss the point of what's happening there. You can go, okay, let's, so let's just go back into that. They leave The hopes was that they would find life, that they would find uh, hope in the land of Moab. They go, and all of a sudden, Elimelech dies. It doesn't say for what reason, but he dies. Not exactly what they were anticipating, not exactly what they were hoping. And then, the two sons, they marry Moabite women, and then they die. It doesn't give us much of a time frame there. It just, stating the facts. All of a sudden, Naomi is left there with Ruth and Orpah. And it says they lived there about 10 years, and they died. She was left without her husband. She was left without her two sons, the things that she took to Moab, no longer with her. And to be childless in this society also was to be among the lowest rung of society. If you didn't have a man in your life to provide for you, you were in trouble. You were disadvantaged. There was no one to support you. You had to rely on the generosity of strangers. As I said earlier, there's no moral judgments given in this book about whether or not Elimelech and Naomi should have gone to Moab. It is just retelling the historical events. And I think there is uh, some truth in this statement that where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. But I also think that the Bible was created to, uh, to meditate and ruminate in And we're supposed to think and consider all of these implications and all of these things that are happening. And I hope that's what you're doing uh, this morning. And ask the questions like, should they have brought their children there? What what do other scriptures have to say about uh, this situation? Most people would agree that it was wrong based on previous commands of the Lord and future commands of the Lord for them to have moved to Moab. To even have the children... Uh, intermingle with the Moabite people. But we will see through this story that uh, it's not because God hates other people. Uh, We'll see that God actually uses the Moabite woman Ruth in this book. And that's what this book is actually named after. It's named after Ruth. That God uses her uh, to bring about this awesome story of redemption and eventually the birth of King David who is in the lineage of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. But here's the one thing that we're going to pull out this morning as it pertains to stewardship, and it's this. You are called to steward hard times. You are called to steward hard times. Notice that I didn't say that you are called to be a steward in hard times. I think that's true. But you are to steward hard times when they come your direction, regardless of circumstances, 
This is an awesome truth from the scriptures that you can take hold of and that you see in several scriptures, you see it played out even here, is that you can take charge in the midst of when circumstances are awry. In the midst of hard times, you can be in the driver's seat, per se. Yes, it may be hard, but the commands of God, as we know, are not burdensome. They're given to us for life, and he's given us purpose outside of the things that are happening to us in our lives. So just really quickly, three tips. This is not an exhaustive study in suffering, uh, but this is where the scriptures are going this morning. Just really quickly, three tips that I have found helpful in hard times. Number one, do not check out. That's my number one suggestion. Don't check out during hard times. You may definitely want to check out, and we definitely know, and we've definitely seen it in our lives, and we've seen other people going through this, that whenever hard times are coming, depression is coming in, all of these things are coming in, it is really easy to not do the simple and easy things in life, to not even get up out of bed, to not even take a shower, to not even make yourself breakfast or make your bed, to do simple things like that. But it is important, as we've been studying through this last year, it is important to remember those spiritual disciplines that we have been studying. And it's important for us to remember, like in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, brethren, he says, in the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. He doesn't say only in good times, do that. He says, do this, no matter what's going on. Present your bodies as living sacrifices to the Lord, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may not know how to interact and work through hard times and difficult times, but you do know this, that you have a base in God and that he is calling you to sacrifice yourself for him. We see this in Hebrews chapter 12 uh, as the writer of Hebrews is writing to this Jewish people who are experiencing this hard tribulation, this hard times, and he says this, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. I want to highlight that. Make straight paths for your feet. How do you strengthen? You, you make straight paths for your feet. God has given us straight paths. We don't just check out. And it says this, so that what is lame may not be dislocated. In hard times, we're oft, oftentimes teetering on becoming bitter, self-focused, and not moving forward or leaning into those straight paths. Yes, we're lame, but he's saying do this so that you do not become dislocated and rather that you would be healed. We're teetering on that bitterness to healing. And I know this is hard to hear for a lot of us because some of us feel right here and some of us are leaning here in our situations and things that are happening in our lives. Looking carefully, <clears throat> so it says this, pursue peace with all people, and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You see what he's doing? He's pointing their eyes off of their situation, their circumstance. They're, he's pointing it onto the Lord. He's saying, straighten your paths. Pursue peace with all people, holiness, for which no one will see the Lord. Look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled, lest there be any fornicators or profane persons like Esau, who... For one morsel of food sold his birthright. You remember the story of Esau and Jacob? He was going through a hard time. He was about to die, he felt like. And he's like, I, you know what? I'm going to give up the very thing that, that I care about because I want this food. I want to be happy in this moment. For you know that afterwards when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Man, what a glorious truth for us sufferers. We all will suffer in this life. We'll all go through hard times. But what a glorious truth that in the midst of tragedy, we don't have to check out. There's purpose in the pain. There's purpose through the pain. There's purpose past the pain. And if not for anything else, if you are suffering Know this, that you and your suffering is experienced by God. When we experience pain and suffering, we get a glimpse into the heart of God. And his displeasure with pain and with suffering. 
And we know that one day he will make all things new. Here's my second thing. Don't check out the first. The second one is this, mourn. Now you can hear me say, don't check out and fix your eyes on Jesus. And what that could mean is like, okay, well, I'm not going to think about the pain. I'm not going to think about the suffering, but that's not what I'm saying. The second thing that we see in Scripture, all throughout the passages of Scripture, is that we're called to mourn. We're called to feel the hurt. We're called to feel the wrong that is done. Like, we should know that the world isn't the way it should be. And when pain and suffering come to us, oftentimes we experience that reality check. That we live in a broken and fallen world. And the Bible has so much to say about pain and suffering. The way that the Bible deals with pain and suffering isn't just one chapter in pain and suffering. It is several books. And each of the books have a different perspective. That is insane. And there are so many Psalms that are written about suffering and pain. I'm convinced more and more as I study the scriptures and I see the way that uh, the authors of the, the Bible interacted with pain that we are supposed to look at it, that we're supposed to stare at it, that we're supposed to look at it and mourn, that we're supposed to say, this absolutely is horrible. And what I'm going through, it stinks. Not to ignore it and avoid it, not to numb it away, but to face it. There's emotional psalms where the psalmist cries out. There's whole books dedicated to the wise and the, the, the howls of, of suffering, Job, Lamentations, Habakkuk. So that's the first thing, do not check out. Second thing, do not mourn, or do mourn. And the third thing is this, rely on God's grace. You will likely, listen, you will likely, if you've gone through pain at all or suffering, you will likely address it in the incorrect way. Let me just say that out loud. You are going to deal with it incorrectly. And it's okay. God's grace is sufficient. God's mercy is sufficient. God knows this. You'll see this in every interaction with pain, that the authors who are going through it, they are oftentimes saying, God, why did you do this? Shaking their fists at God. And then God's like, yeah, maybe you should check yourself before I wreck yourself, all right? We should know this, that God gives us strength. He gives us forgiveness, but he also gives us strength. And so what we do is we rely on God's grace in the midst of suffering. When we're weak, he is strong. As Paul, the apostle, was going through suffering in his life, and he asked God, take this away from me. God's reply was, Paul, I'm not going to take it away. Instead, I'm going to give you grace. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made strong in your weakness. If you're going through something, allow this verse to be balm to your soul, that God is working in you, and God wants to show his power in you. And sometimes, yes, what that may look like is that may look like God delivering you out of the pain in a miraculous way. But oftentimes, and most often what I've seen, is that God's power in you is through the moments where you take that first step. And you take the next step. And you do the things that he's called you to do. And you begin to see healing in your life. We have a pretty easy case study just three years ago, four years ago. But this is a good question. How did you steward 2020? That was a hard time. It's a hard time in our history. 2020, it's far away. But we can look back and say, how did I steward that time? How do you steward hard times? Let's continue in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. During all of this, after the death of her husband and two sons, it says this, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab, which implies that times were hard for her because she's in the field relying on the generosity of strangers, that the Lord, Yahweh, had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. So their sojourning is done, is finished. And it's just her that's left with her two daughter-in-laws, or daughters-in-law. She knew that the food was there, but she also knew this, as a widow... The scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, 
God placed in the Hebrew scriptures commands to look after widows. Exodus 22, verse 22 and 24, it says this, you shall not mistreat any widow or the fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they will cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with a sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. That's a pretty extreme command, right? He's like, do not mistreat widows. If you do, pain and suffering will come to you. You hear that? What we can see from this is that God cares about you and your distress. God cares about you and what you're going through. God cares about your situation. God cares about the marginalized. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I'm gonna read it again because that's a really good verse. You should memorize it. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you're going through it, you may seem and feel like you are far away from God, but remember this, please. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. This is exactly how I describe Naomi. Verse eight, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. They were all going through this pain and suffering. Verse 10, and they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. No, Naomi, we're going to stay with you. She's like, you guys have an out. Go back. You guys are young enough. Go, go marry, go have kids, go find a, a Moabite man to, to, to help you. I, I'm in trouble. And it says that they showed her Hesed, which is that loyal, loving kindness that we read about in the scriptures that God is described as having for his people. Verse 11, it says this, Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? This doesn't make any sense. Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, verse 13, would you therefore wait till they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. That couldn't be further from the truth, Naomi. The hand of the Lord has not gone out against you. But you can hear her despair. You can hear her regret. You can hear hear her guilt. And Naomi knew what she needed to do. And she knew that that road would not be an easy path for a Moabite woman going back into the land of Israel. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Verse 15, and she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And I love this. And this is like the, 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 the main verse of all of Ruth right here. This, if it could be summed up, it would be in this right here. Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May Yahweh do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Orpah said, okay, I'm out of here. But Ruth clings to Naomi. And we see this faithful, we see this said, this loyal, loving kindness in Ruth that we know in God. This commitment and this even profession of faith that this Moabitess woman has toward Yahweh, the God of Israel. Where you die, I will die. Where you're buried, I will be buried. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Ruth was willing to forsake her Moabite gods that she grew up with and embrace the God of Israel. How beautiful. 
she decides to follow him in the midst of the pain and the suffering. And here's the next thing we can pull from this. You are responsible for your response. You are responsible for your response. We are all responsible for our own spiritual decisions in the midst of everything. We are to steward our response to God in the midst of life. Whatever we've been given, we are to respond to him. And we're responsible for that. No one else. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. It says this, He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord. You hear that? Every person ever created was put there so that they would seek the Lord. When I read this, I think God has given the best opportunity for every person with the knowledge that he has and the knowledge that they have to make that decision. And we see that in Ruth. We see that with this Moabite woman, Ruth. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. The most responsible thing you can do with your life this morning is give it to God. To accept the gift that he offers to you. The gift that he offers to you through Jesus. Through his provision. The most responsible thing, the best way to steward your life is to give it to the owner. To stop running. To give your life to him. And for us who have made that decision for Christ, here's a little extra. You know what else that means? It means this. You may not like this sermon. You may think, man, Lee is bombing. You may think, oh, man, I wish it was Eric's week. You may think a lot of things. But you're responsible for your spiritual life. You are responsible when the word of God is opened to listen to God through the broken cracks of the speakers, the broken cracks of the presentation, you're responsible, listen, you're responsible even in the midst of bad song selections to align your heart to God. Oh man, I wish they would sing more hymns. Or oh man, I wish they would bring that electric guitar out more. We each are more, are responsible for our own spiritual lives. Man, I really, if, if they would have done this, I could have gotten a little bit more out of church. This is a little bit more of what I'm saying. Yes, I do believe, you know, we, we need to do things to the best of our abilities. But at the same time, each of us is responsible to God for our spiritual decisions. To align our hearts to God. And we see that with Ruth. In the midst of the cracks and the brokenness of relationships, in the midst of this circumstance and situation where, it seems, where things seem grim, we see Ruth standing up and making a proclamation of faith that she believed in the God of Yahweh and that she was putting all of her rocks in this bag. She's like, I'm this, everything, everything, I'm, I'm putting everything in there. So there it is. It goes on further. Uh, let's just go to verse 19 as we kind of wrap up. Sorry, guys. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Okay, so just, just take yourself there. Naomi's coming back into the land of Bethlehem where she left. It's been 10 years she comes into Bethlehem. The whole town is stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. That, her name in Hebrew means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her. 
who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Just a few things I want to note here as we're beginning to close. The one thing that sticks out to me most is when she says, I left full, and now I've come back empty. Do you remember what happened at the very beginning? Did she leave full? No, but she did. In the midst of the circumstances and situations, just imagine, like, what are the things that matter? The things that matter are the people that you're with. When she looked back at the hard time that she was going through, she doesn't look back at the lack of no food. Yeah, that was a, that was a factor in why they left and everything. But as she looked back, she said, I was full at one point. I had my husband and I had my two sons. I left full. Now God is bringing me back and I have nothing to show. We didn't have much, but we had each other, right? One point she had this fullness. Now it wasn't there anymore. I can imagine, it's, it kind of reminds me of like a scene from like a movie, like a war movie, you know, where somebody experiences the, the, the pangs of war and everything happens and they come back into their hometown, they're missing limbs, they're kind of like beat and battered. It reminds me of even, I mean, this is crazy, but it reminds me of like the presidents, right? Have you ever seen those pictures of the presidents, uh, like when they first got into term and then uh, at the end you're like, wow, you have aged a lot, like you have went through a lot. Now, it hasn't happened the last two times because they were old the whole time. Um, but, but typically, you're like, man, look at that young buck, man, coming in. And eight years later, you're like, whoa, the job, man. That's a hard job, man. That's a lot. This is kind of what you can kind of envision happening with Naomi as she's coming into the city of Bethlehem. People are looking at her and saying, wow, the years, they've been, they've been kind of harsh. And you don't have what you had when you left. She's coming back a little bit more bitter, a little bit more worn, maybe leathered skin, not quite as soft. But this is what you get at the end of chapter one. And I'm excited to go into the next few chapters and speak more on stewardship. But before we do that, I'll pray and uh, close out. Lord, thank you for... um, today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can open it up and that we can uh, investigate the scriptures. Uh, Thank you that you have called us to steward uh, our lives. You called us to steward our lives no matter what's going on in our lives, especially hard times. God, when it is really tempting for us to let go, when it's really tempting for us to give up, God, it is those times that you tell us even more to press in, to trust you, It's in those times that you tell us to uh, experience the pain. It's in those times that you don't just leave us there and that you meet us there. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to steward uh, the lives that you've given us in the midst of everything that's going on. Help us uh, to not look back like Ruth or like uh, Naomi did and say, man, my life was full. But may we see that in these moments that our life is full because we are in you. Lord, for people in here who uh, do not know you, for anyone in here who doesn't know you or listening through, uh, through, line, through online, I pray that you would help them to uh, just release their Uh, ownership of their lives to the real owner, that they release it to you. Lord, I thank you that the scriptures say this, that we love because you first loved us. And you call us to respond to you. Lord, so I ask that uh, you would find in us willing hearts to respond rightly to your word and to your prompting, the promptings of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you that you made a way for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you suffered 
that you bled, that you died, that you experienced the pains of, of death and life, and that you rose victorious. I pray that you bless uh, each person here this morning and uh, help us to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, everybody said.